welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Luke Cobray. Go ahead and get down on my knees. Go before the Lord in prayer. Uh, if you're able to stand as we pray, could you uh, join me in prayer and stand together? Father, we come before you. And Lord, we're just so grateful for the opportunity to be here tonight. Lord, we don't take it for granted. We don't come into church to hear from the old or the young or the black, the white, the brown. Lord, we don't come to hear from a man or a woman. God, we don't come to church for entertainment or for tradition. But, Lord, we do come to hear from you. And we fully acknowledge that Jesus Christ is the senior leader of this church. And so, Lord, we ask in the name of Jesus that your Holy Spirit would speak to us, minister to us, show us things, counsel us in the word of God as we get into it today, Lord. I pray that it would be a seed that is planted into our hearts, into our lives, that we would bear much fruit because of our lives being good ground, Lord, as we would take that word of God that we hear tonight, Lord, and we would cultivate it. We would pay attention to it. We would apply it and live it. And, Lord, I thank you that your word is alive and powerful. Lord, and you, as we get into it today, Lord, I pray that it would speak to us. Lord, we thank you for all the blessings that you've given to us, your church. Lord, these blessings that we, don't, we ask, we don't ask upon ourselves, but Lord, upon all the churches across the world and around the Inland Empire that are teaching and preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. At the Rock Church and World Outreach Center, we never think of ourselves as better than anybody else because truly we are co-laborers, brothers and sisters in the body of Christ, all working together to build your kingdom for your glory. So, Father, we ask that your hand would be upon our different denominational brothers and sisters, our Baptists and Pentecostal and, and charismatic brothers and sisters. Father, we thank you for the local churches in the area, for Harvest and Sandals and the Grove. Father, we thank you for the Well and the Way and Emmanuel. Lord, we thank you for Ecclesia. God, for Crossroads, for New Creation. Lord, we thank you for Abundant Living. All the churches all around the area, too many truly to, to name, praise God. But Lord, we thank you that we are all working together for your glory, for your kingdom. And Lord, to you be the praise and the glory and the honor. In Jesus' mighty name, we all said... Amen. Praise God. I'm excited for what we've got. Like I said, it's going to be a little bit different. Sometimes different is good. We'll find out if tonight's different is good or not. God is good. So if you've got your Bibles, go to the book of Jeremiah. Let's turn to the book of Jeremiah. Tonight what we're going to do is we're going to just take a quick look. I'm not going to, I'm not going to teach long. Those are famous last words of, of many a pastor. And uh, more than often than not, I am not a man of my word when it comes to that statement, but we'll see tonight. Praise God. God is good. So here we are. We're talking about uh, the title of tonight's message. I had to turn to the book of Jeremiah. I don't think I told you where to go, did I? You should know. No, I'm just kidding. Jeremiah in the 33rd chapter. Jeremiah in the 33rd chapter. Jeremiah in the 33rd chapter. Tonight we're going to talk about the title of the message is this, Hearing from God. Hearing from God. Now, some of you may have joined with us in the month of January as we went on a corporate fast. We didn't say specifically what to fast or how to fast, but we encouraged the church body to participate along with us. Did anybody in here tonight participate in some form or fashion in the month of January doing a fast to seek after the Word of God? Look at you guys. Booyah, right on. Did anybody hear from the Word of God? Did anybody hear from God during that fast? All right, a couple of the, some of the hands went down. All right. It's okay. Isaiah the 58th chapter has a great uh, teaching on fasting before the Lord. Too bad we can't get into that tonight. But we're going to talk about hearing from God because truly the purpose of this fast. I remember I was at a family function. It was about a week into the fast. And for me, now that it's over, I can talk about it, I guess. Is, you know, we didn't want to talk about it. We didn't want to publicize it. But for me, I went on what, what uh, is labeled in our day and age the Daniel fast. It's based out of Daniel the 10th chapter and where Daniel only ate. Basically, veggies and things that were unpleasing to the eye. And I remember I was in a state, it was in a room, it was my sister actually, Pastor Jessica, and she was talking about the Daniel fast one time because they're healthy eaters. And they were like, you know, that's not even really a fast for us, that's no big deal. And it was about like a week into it. And my wife and I had spent that first week crying ourselves to sleep at night. Because <laughs> there really are two types of people in this world there are people who eat to live. And then there are people who live to eat. And I quickly learned on day 0.25 that I was one of those people that lived to eat because the Daniel fast was hard for me. But I remember there were certain things, that, uh, just during the process, there were certain things that just would come upon me. I remember I was cooking onions of, of oh, just how wonderful that sounds. No, no, there wasn't anything else to it. Uh, onions, just, just cooking, yeah, there was nothing else. Onions. And my wife came home and she was like, what is that awful smell in this house? I forgot to put oil in the pan. So anyways, 
okay, I don't cook, all right? But I remember God was speaking to me. It was vivid to me. I remember it was one of those things where God said something during that process, and I was like, this is really fun, this cooking. It wasn't. It turned out horrible. That was a terrible meal. But God spoke to me. And it was so amazing that God, it was like he dropped a, a, just a, a, a little nugget of insight for me in my life. And it was like, oh, this is why I'm doing this. I get it. And that's the purpose of that. As we went to hear from God, I remember I was back to the original story if it'd be on my rabbit trail. I was with some family members and they had in and out. It was about a week into it. We had salad. Remember that? We had lettuce. They had it in and out. They brought it. And, and, and we had a baked potato with nothing else, just the potato in the microwave, and, and lettuce with nothing else on it. Water as dressing. It was amazing. <laughs> as they had their in and out. And I remember my family member was like, so what are you doing? I'm like, oh, well, we're fasting. What is that? And so I tried to explain it. Why would you do that? Well, because I want to hear from God. What do you want to hear from God about? Whatever God wants to speak about, I, don't, I just, it really challenged me though, like, what am I looking for? What am I seeking after? Because, you know, sometimes we just say, oh, I'm going to fast to hear from God, but God says, listen, man, I want, I want you to come after me. I want you to seek after me. I want you to come after me, ask for it, the Bible says, we'll see that in a moment. Ask for the wisdom and see that I'll give it to you liberally, without reproach. So tonight we're going to talk about hearing from God, and I had you turn to Jeremiah in the 33rd chapter. Three simple things tonight out of, out of the Word of God and, and, some, and some biblical truth and hearing from the Word of God and more so how to hear from the Word of God. In Jeremiah, the 33rd chapter, here Jeremiah the prophet is speaking to, to Israel, to the nation that's in captivity. It's a message of hope, this 33rd chapter. It's a message of restoration. There's, there, there, there's, the, 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 the country has been put away in ruins. Uh, he goes on to say later on in the 33rd chapter that, uh, that Judah and Israel, they're, they're ruins, but there will be herds and livestock back again in this desolate place. It's been, it's been laid to waste. And in, in Jeremiah, in the 33rd chapter, verse number 3, God is speaking to his people. And he says, call to me, and I will answer you, and I'll show you great and mighty things which you don't know. Call to me, and I will answer you. And show you great and mighty things which you don't know. See, today I just want to talk about hearing from God. Simple, easy, short. God's desire for the church is church. Call to me. And I'll show you. Oftentimes, and we'll look at this a little bit. Oftentimes we go to the committee. We go to the family member. Oh my Lord, we go to the internet. Before we go to God. I love how Pastor Jenny, when he was here, he, he used the reference. He says, Wikipedia defined this as. And I was just like, oh, Wikipedia. We go to Wikipedia. What does the Bible say about this? And Wikipedia pops up. I remember when we were in college, my wife and I, we were never allowed. I mean, you would, like, get stoned in college if you used Wikipedia as a source. Remember, You know why? Because it's user edited. I remember one time I Googled the Milky Way galaxy, and I showed my wife. It said it was a, a, a marshmallow galaxy. Wikipedia, the front line, said it was a marshmallow galaxy with an ever-expanding marshmallow that was going to consume the earth in marshmallow juice. <laughs> and at that point, I realized, okay, this is why they say, don't believe everything you read on the internet. But God is saying to us, church, call to me. Call to me. Seek after me. And I'll hear, and I'll talk to you. I'll speak to you. I'll show you a great and mighty thing. It's not about what Wikipedia says. It's not about what WebMD says. It's not about what going to your family members or to your friends or to your council says. Yeah, those are great. Those are wonderful resources. But they should always come second, third, fourth, fifth, or not even at all when the Word of God speaks louder than all of those. And we as a church have got to realize that there are some things in our lives that we have to do in order to hear from God. I know. That's not easy. That's not fun. We just want to say, well, God says, speak. I'll tell you. Seek me. But you have to understand there's things as a church, as followers of Christ, that we have got to do in our own life in order for us to hear from God. The reason is, is God's desire for us is to seek him, like we talked about, like we sang in those songs, to come after him. He says, call to me. So today, what I want to do is I want to look at three simple, quick, easy things on hearing from God. 
Three words. Can, can, you, can you maybe remember three words tonight in how to hear from God? Tonight, hearing from God, three things. Hearing from God, number one, position. It's a position thing. We have to be in a position to hear from God. Now, that doesn't mean that we can't cry out to God now, and I have to specify this because we live on a razor edge, a razor's edge in our society where somebody says something and somebody will take that statement and totally twist it around. We're talking about hearing from God, not God hearing from us. So when I say position, I'm going to get to, you guys know where I'm going, I'm talking about a position of right standing with God. I'm not saying that you have to be righteous in order to, for God to hear from you. Because God listens to the cries of the sinner. That's how we get saved. That's how we find our salvation is God hears us. But in response to hearing from God, to getting wisdom and insight and direction and blessing, I don't know about you, but I in my life want wisdom, insight, direction, and blessing. Does anybody else in this place want any of that in their life? In order for us to receive from God, we have to put ourselves in a position to hear. We have to be in that place so that we can hear from God. We need to be in right standing with God. Today we're going to look at some illustrations. I'm going to, talk, I'm going to look at a guy, Abraham. We've used him a lot as examples. Abraham was a man who heard from God. Literally heard from God. From the very beginning in Genesis, the 12th chapter, when we hear about him, God says to Abraham, get up, go to a land, I'll show you. I'm not even going to tell you where. And I will make you blessed. Abraham gets up and does it. Abraham hears from God. God tells Abraham, do this, and he does it. God tells Abraham, do this, and he does it. We're going to look at Abraham as an example. We're going to look at Jesus as an example. We're going to look at our own lives as example. But you see, we need to be in a position of right standing with God because God's not going to speak to us what we want when we're out of alignment with him. It's like Parenting 101. We've talked about this. You've heard this probably a hundred times at the church. If your kid is in, in disobedience, if your child, if you're a parent, if they're disobeying what you're saying, if they are being just downright bad, you're not going to impart blessing onto them. My little kid yesterday, we were tearing out, oh, this, this project, home improvement project from hell. I don't even want to get into there. There's a whole other message that I have to still preach to myself before I can even talk to you guys. We were sweeping up drywall dust and nails on our floor. It was in this big pile. My little kid, he has his little bike with training wheels, and he just rides around the house, just like, just around and around. And he rode right through the pile. Bjorn, don't you, Daddy, I rode right through your pile, and I'm not going to say I'm sorry. Bjorn, that's really mean. Why would you do that? i got to sweep it all up again. Bjorn, that's really mean. You shouldn't do that. I'm not saying I'm sorry, Dad. He gets back on his bike, rides, rides through the pile again as I'm sweeping it up. Uh-huh. Now, remember, I said home improvement project from hell, so Dad wasn't saying this with a smile, okay? Dad was preaching to himself on the inside as my wife is saying, babe, don't say that, babe, don't say that, babe, don't say that. I'm not going to bless him as he's driving through my dirt pile and I'm sweeping up. I'm not going to say, well, Bjorn... Everybody knows you like Reese's. You know what? Here's a Reese's because you disobeyed what Dad said and you purposely said. See, we have got to put ourselves in a position to hear from God. I'm not talking about we have to get good in order for God to hear us. But in order to hear from God, we have to position ourselves to be ready to hear. Now, we said we were talking about Abraham. Before we go to Abraham, let me show you that biblically. Let me just back that up at the Word of God. I think that's always a good thing when a preacher backs up a statement with the word of God. Amen? Amen? Hallelujah for that. In James, the first chapter, verse number five, one of the verses that I love so much in my own life, it says, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, he who gives all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. Don't you love how the Bible says God will give it to you? We're talking about hearing from God. Here it is. If anybody lacks wisdom, ask God. He'll give it to you liberally and without reproach. Verse number six, but... There's a conditional statement there. Let him ask in faith with no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. Verse number seven comes on along to say some very strong and harsh words. And he goes on to say, do not let that man suppose he'll receive anything from God. 
God says if you are out of positional alignment, if you're not in right standing, if you're not in faith, if you're not believing, if you're not ready to hear or ready to receive or ready to get the word of God in you, what makes you think you're going to hear? We've got to position ourselves, church. We have to allow ourselves, let the word of God to influence and affect us and live right standing, which means oftentimes in our life, we have to say no to things our flesh says yes to in order to be in right standing so that we could be in a position so that God would speak much like a fast. It's, like fast. it's the same thing as a fast. We say no to things we like so that we would hear from God. A fast is only a mirror image of what our lives oftentimes have to be like. But we have to position ourselves. Abraham, if you've got your Bibles, go with me to the book of Genesis. The book of Genesis in the 17th chapter. Abraham, he's heard God, he's moved He's gone through some adventures already. God gave him Abraham a promise that I will make you great. You will be a blessed, a great nation in you. All the nations of the world will be blessed. I'll bless those who bless you. I'll curse those who curse you. God gives Abraham this great promise. In Genesis in the 17th chapter, God says to Abraham, verse number 1. Genesis in the 17th chapter, verse number 1. God says to Abraham, verse number 1. When Abraham, Abram, who we will see as Abraham after this, when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am almighty God. Walk before me and be blameless. Gives Abraham a conditional statement. Walk before me and be blameless. Abraham, live righteous. Righteousness, as I learned a long time ago in Bible school was right standing with God, to live in a position of right standing with God. He says, walk before me and be blameless, be righteous. Verse number two goes on to say, and I will make my covenant between me and you and will multiply you exceedingly. God tells Abraham, when you position yourself in my righteousness, in my alignment, you will hear from me. I will make my covenant. You will, I will do things in your life. We want to hear from God. We want to see God operate. We want to see God move in our lives. We've got to position ourselves to be ready to hear the word of God. In Psalms, the 37th chapter, I'll put it up on the overhead because it's the New Living Translation. Psalms, the 37th chapter, the New King James says, the, the steps of a good man are ordered of the Lord. Verse number 23 of the New Living Translation, the Psalms 37 says, The Lord directs the steps of the godly. He delights in every detail of their lives. Oftentimes we hear this statement as the, the steps of the righteous are ordered of the Lord. Could it be that God directs the steps of the godly because they're in alignment to hear what he has to say? It's like driving on the road. GPS says, turn right here. We are positionally ready to turn right here. Whereas the ungodly have the voice on mute. So we've got to put ourselves in a position to hear God's voice, which means, church, that we have to live right standing with God. It means we have to be. Now, it doesn't mean that we have to get legalistic in the things that we do and don't do, and we can't say thou shalt, thou shalt not. We get so wrapped up in this. But at the same time, when we get the word of God in our lives, things change. And as things change, our position changes. We draw closer to God. We become more like God. We're talking about hearing from God. Number one today was position. Number two? Reception. You know, it's like back in the day, cell phones have gotten a lot better. Do you remember you had to adjust your position to have reception? Do you remember that? It's not so bad. Remember the little antennas? Pastor Jim, he had like a cell phone in the 80s, man. It was, it was like that Zach Morris one. Anybody have one? Did anybody have like the, the big, you know what I'm talking about, the big block? Weighed like a pound and a half. I remember Pastor Jim had a briefcase, and his briefcase was like for the phone. And Pastor Jessica used it and had like a $4,000 cell, cell phone bill one time. I mean, it was crazy. But do you remember the days where you had the little antenna you'd have to pull out? And you, oh, wait, hold on. Remember the Verizon commercial? Can you hear me now? Wait, wait. Can you hear me now? Remember? Reception. You've got to be in a position to have reception. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go a little bit geek on you. It's called Newton's Third Law of Physics. For every action, there is a reaction. What reception is, is an acceptance. When you have a wedding reception, what are you doing? You're receiving what people are giving, or you're receiving the, the guests. When you have a, a welcome home reception, somebody's coming home, you are saying, we are receiving you. 
We are opening our arms and taking you in. And hearing from God involves reception. I'm not talking about cell phone reception. God, are you there? No, I'm talking about welcoming God's word with open arms to hearing from God and receiving because like Newton's third law says, every action has a reaction, which means that when you hear God, there's a reaction that follows. You pray, God speaks. God speaks, you react. You react, God moves. God moves, you change. You change, you pray. You pray, God speaks. God speaks, you see what I'm saying? For every action, there's a reaction. We're not just talking about physics. I'm truly, I'm one of those believers that science echoes the word of God over and over again. To every prayer, there's a reaction. This is oftentimes where we as Christians miss it. I cannot tell you how many times in my own life God has answered or spoken to me something in a prayer. Looking back, you know, they say hindsight is 20-20. Looking back on my life. God has spoken and answered a prayer to me. And I say, wow, totally not the way I thought it was going to happen. Totally not even what I asked for. You know, they always say, like, don't pray for patience. Don't pray for, because you're not just going to get, a, 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 you're not going to just get patience. You're going to get the opportunity. You know what I mean? You know what I'm talking about? I'm talking about reception. There's been times, God, I need this. And it's not like, Somebody, you know, off the checks in the mail are great. God, I need money. Checks in the mail. Checks in the mail. My mailbox is empty, man. <laughs> I'm professing that one because I see everybody hooting and hollering about checks in the mail. I'm like, where's my cut? <laughs> but it comes this way or it comes that way or it comes some other completely different way. See, oftentimes we, we go to God and we say, God, I want to hear from you. But if only it sounds like this. God, I want to see from you. I want, I want to receive from you, but only if it looks like this. God, I want you in my life. God, I need your wisdom, but only if it comes in this fashion. We get so wrapped up in our own lives that we fail to see that God's saying, He's, I don't want to put my will in your life. I want your life to fit into my will. And so we've got to realize that we've got to be in a place to receive from the things of God. We hear from God. God speaks, Lord, I need wisdom. There it is. And all of a sudden, I don't know if that was God or not. Let me, go, let, me, let me go over here and talk to so-and-so. Hey, listen, I think God said this to me. What do you think? Well, you know, pray about it. That's always the answer. Go on Yahoo Answers. I prayed about this, and this is what I feel like God is saying. You get all those answers. You see, we go to the committee. We go to the family member. We, we bounce it off the wall like spaghetti. Throw it and see if it sticks. Oh, if it sticks, it must have been God. God is saying, I want you to be receptive. When I speak, boom, you do it. Don't go to the committee. Don't go to the neighborhood. Don't get everybody together with a powwow and say, I think God said this. Because God says, when I speak, listen to me. It's his desire for the church, and we miss it. Look what Jesus in his own life, Jesus exemplifies this for us in Matthew, the 26th chapter. I'll put it on the overhead because you're in Genesis and we'll be there in a second. Jesus fell on his face and prayed. Verse number 39. Oh, my father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Jesus admits before going to the cross, I don't want to go. But he says, nevertheless, not my will, but as you will. God, I pray for this answer. Be aware that the answer may not come the way you want it or the way you think, but it will come if you ask. And you have to be receptive to however it comes. That's the key. That's the hard part. It's not easy. It's not an amen, praise the Lord, hallelujah, Pastor Luke. But it's truth. That God answers prayers the way God answers prayers, not the way we always want them to be answered. But the reality is, is that God answers prayers prayers. We have got to understand that. Sometimes we say, well, God's not listening to me. And God's like, dude, I answered it. Look in front of you. It's just not the way you thought. We have got to open our eyes to see how God works. We're talking about Abraham. Back to Abraham. We're talking about the, the reception. In Genesis, you're there in the 17th chapter. Look at the, a couple chapters over in verse number 22. Genesis in the 22nd chapter. Abraham's promise has been fulfilled about an heir to receive these promises. 
Abraham and Isaac. In verse number one, it says, Now these things came to pass that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, he said, Here I am, position. He said, Now take your son. God knows what he's asking. Take your son, your only son, who you love. God knows how Abraham feels about Isaac. He says, Take your son, your only son, who you love, and go to the land of Moriah. Offer him as a burnt offering. On one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. It doesn't say verse number three. So Abraham went to talk to Sarah. It doesn't say verse number three. So Abraham gathered his family together. All right, all right, all right, all right. Family powwow. Family powwow. God just told me, Isaac, tell me what you think, all right? God just told me to take you to that hill and sacrifice you. Because you know, the family would have been like, get behind me, Satan. <laughs> Reception. Reception. Look what it says, verse number, number three. So Abraham rose early in the morning. Abraham rose early in the morning. So Abraham slept that night in agony, probably thinking about what God had responded to their conversation. But early in the morning, when his head woke off that pillow, he didn't say, well, it's time to get the committee together. It's time to bounce this off the wall and see if it was God. It's God that spoke to me because I know the voice of the Lord. You see, Jesus said to my, my sheep, I am the great shepherd, and my sheep know my name. The devil might try to come and sound like him, but when you and I are positionally right with God, we know the voice of our shepherd. And so God speaks to Abraham, and Abraham arose early in the morning. Abraham rose early in the morning. He took the wood. He took Isaac up to the mount. You see, for every action, there is a reaction. God's action was to test Abraham. Abraham, I want your son. Isaac says, or uh, Abraham says, I'll get up and do it. You and I have got to be receptive that when we hear from God, we receive it. Because if we don't receive what the word of God is or what the voice of God is in our life, it's a direct insult. Have you ever, has somebody ever gone to you or come to you and been like, look, man, I'm going through something. I need your opinion. I need your advice. I need you to help me out right now. I need to help. And you give them your advice. Well, I think you ought to do this. You ought to do this. And you're just like, you can feel it. Man, the Holy Spirit's on you. And you're like, bam, 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 bam. And they're like, thanks, I'm going to do this. <laughs> has anybody ever been there before? Like, you've given the advice. You thought, man, it's like the best advice ever. <laughs> and then they tell you, oh, you know what, man, that was, that was wrong. I'm going to do this. I'll do it over here. When they come back to you next week and they're like, oh, I need some more advice. How do you feel? Oh, yeah, hold on. Let me, let me open up the book of advice. No, 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 no. You see, God says, I'm speaking. I want you to listen. When you listen, I want you to receive it. When you receive it, then I speak again. I know that you're going to hear it. God tested Abraham. He tested Abraham. He wanted to see the position that Abraham was in. Abraham received what God had said. Last one for tonight. Hearing from God, number three, takes diligence. Follow through. Got to do it. Not just receive it. Praise God, Lord, I hear that I receive it. Abraham woke up early in the morning, but that's not diligence. That's waking up. That's going on a road trip. Abraham took Isaac to the mountain. That's great. Camping. Wilderness. Guys, night out. Abraham had to follow through. He had to build the altar. He had to tell his son when his son asked him, where's the sacrifice? God will provide. When they were building the altar, Abraham had to follow through with it. When they were laying the sticks and Isaac was helping Abraham gather the sticks to lay on his own altar, Abraham had to follow through. When Isaac laid there on the, on the altar and Abraham looked at him in the eyes with knife in hand, ready to do what God had asked him to do, Abraham had to follow through. You see, follow through oftentimes can be the hardest part because we get so wrapped up in life. We get so caught up in business or we get so caught up in the busyness of life that we forget to do what God directed us. And then we go and we wonder, where are you, God? Why aren't you speaking to me when God says, you never finished what I said to do? It's going to take a diligence for us, the church, to be faithful to God. In Genesis, the 22nd chapter, you're already there. Verse number 16. As, as Abraham, knife is in the air. He's ready to go. You think he had an opportunity right there to say, did I hear from God right? As he's looking at his son, the angel of the Lord appears and says, stop. Now I know you're faithful. Now I know you're positionally right with me because you heard me. Now I know 
that you're receptive to what I have to say because you followed through. Here you are today, ready to do what I asked you to do, even though it sounded crazy, even though it, wasn't, it was contrary to what you would have thought I would have asked. And God says, now I know. Church, you and I have got to be diligent to follow through with the word of God so he can look at us and say, now I know that when I give you wisdom, when you ask for it, now I know you're not just going to take it and throw it away or throw it by the wayside. But now I know you're going to take the word of God, you're going to use it, you're going to apply it, you're going to live it, you're going to operate it. You're going to find yourself effective in the kingdom of God. And so God says to him, by myself I've sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing and not withheld your son, your only son, blessing I'll bless you, multiplying I'll multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven and the sand which is on the seashore. And your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. In your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Why? Because you obeyed my voice. God said, Abraham, here was the test. I spoke to you. I told you you'd have an inheritance. I told you you'd live right before me. Abraham lived right. God said, I'll give you a son. Abraham said, I don't have any, any kin. I don't have any, any inheritance. God said, you'll get one. Abraham got one. God says, I want it. Abraham got up, took him to the altar. God says, I want your son. Abraham followed through and obeyed his voice. And because God said, I want your son, he said, here is mine. You see, God wasn't being unreasonable. He made a covenant with Abraham. He asked Abraham for his most valuable possession, and Abraham was willing to do it, so therefore God, according to his oath, was willing to give his most valuable possession, Jesus Christ, to follow through. Speaking of Jesus, who prayed that prayer, I'll put it up on the overhead, it says in Philippians, the second chapter, Jesus, in being a pound, found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. He followed through. He followed through. He could have been there before Pilate, after, after being scorned, after being beaten. He could have been like, okay, wait a minute, wait a minute. I didn't think it was going to be this bad. Okay? When the, when the priests were mocking him on the cross, saying, if you're really Jesus, come down off that cross and rescue yourself and us. He could have been like, you know what, God? I'm going to do that. But he didn't. He was obedient. He obeyed the voice of God because he said, it's not my will, yours be done. Church, we want to hear from God. We've got to go after God. We've got to seek after God. We've got to call to God and he'll show us. He'll, he'll, he'll deliver to us the wisdom like James promises. But we have to be in a position to receive it. Which means we have to be in right standing because if we're not, we're double-minded and unstable in all our ways. And the Bible says, let not us suppose we're going to get anything. When we're in the right position, we have got to be receptive. Which means it may not come the way we thought. It may not look the way we had hoped. But when God answers, we listen and receive it with open arms. Saying, God, not my will, but your be done. And once we've received it, to not just leave it at acceptance, but to follow through with diligence. Say, God, I'll obey your voice. I will listen to your word. And I will fulfill what you have given to me. I will follow through with what you have spoken to me. And I promise you, church, when we do, we will hear the voice of God. Every time Abraham was faithful, God spoke to him. Pastor Dan and I were talking about it today. God said, Abraham, go here. Boom, he did that. God spoke to him. God said, Abraham, do this. He wouldn't do it. God spoke to Pharaoh instead or spoke to the king instead. And then Abraham confessed, did, it, did what God told him to do. Boom, God spoke to him. God said, Abraham, over here. Boom, God spoke to him. His son, Jacob. His son, or his son, Isaac. Isaac's son, Jacob. Same thing over and over and over and over. God is desiring for you and I to be right standing with him to be accepting of his word, and to be diligent in following through with what he gives us so that when he speaks, he knows he can say to Abraham, like he said to Abraham, he can say to you and I, now I know. Did you guys get something out of the word of the Lord tonight? <laughs> hey, listen, I want to do one more thing tonight before we go any further. I want to give you guys the opportunity to examine your heart with, and your life with God. You see, the worst thing that we could do in our day and age, listen up real close, please don't get up, please don't walk around, please don't leave. Just listen to me for a moment. It's very important what we're about to talk about. See, the worst thing that you and I could do in our day and age, in our lives, is to live in a trap that we don't realize that we're in. To live a life that is in deception or on false pretenses. Nobody wants to be deceived. Nobody wants to have the wool pulled over their eyes. So let me ask you a question, and let's examine those answers in your heart to see where you stand in your relationship with God. The question is simply put like this. If you were to leave right now tonight and die, boom, 
Would you go to heaven or would you go to hell? And the question that follows is what makes you think so? You see, there are so many things that in our lives we have been fed as a society. From, from, from wherever it might be, from all directions, certain things that make us think that we're going to get into heaven. But let me tell you something. There's some biblical truths that you and I have got to understand. That nowhere in the Bible can you get to heaven because you want to go. Because you think so. Because you believe that there's some existence after life. You're not going to find that in the Word of God. Nowhere in the Bible are you going to find that because your parents told you as you were a kid growing up that you're a Christian. Or because you went to church on Christmas and on Easter, or because you were baptized or christened, or because you went to Sunday school classes that you're going to go to heaven. Nowhere in the Word of God does it say that because you call yourself a Christian, because you wear a cross around your neck, that you're going to go to heaven. You know, that's like saying I'm a Dodger because I sat in the Dodger sta stadium in the dugout. It doesn't matter where I sit. It doesn't matter what I do. It doesn't matter what the uniform I have on. I won't be a part of the Dodgers. Why? Because that's not who I am. Just because you call yourself a Christian. Just because your parents told you you were a Christian. Just because you have an earnest desire to go somewhere after you die. Doesn't mean that's going to get you into heaven. You see, the answer, the truth is, is that it's God's heaven. The only way to get to God's heaven is God's way, and that is through Jesus Christ. Jesus said this. He said that he is the way, the truth, and the life. No one goes to the Father except through him. We think in our lives, oh, well, I'm a good person. I've never cheated on my taxes. I've never robbed a 7-Eleven. I've done more good in my life than bad. That means I'm going to get to heaven. The Bible says that our good deeds according to God's righteousness are like filthy rags. Well, but Pastor Luke, I know the John 3.16, or I, I was a volunteer in the youth or the children's ministry, I sang in the choir. Did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you memorized scripture, that because you attended church, because you were a leader or an usher or a volunteer, that you're going to get into heaven? God's not after the outward appearance. Because God's perfection, or God's standard for heaven, excuse me, is perfection. But the Bible says in Romans, the third chapter, that we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, which means we have all fallen short of God's standard, which means there's nothing you and I could do on our own to ever make us good enough to get into heaven. It doesn't matter how, well, how much we think, how much we wish. It doesn't matter how positive our, look, our outlook on life is. It doesn't matter what we've been told or it doesn't matter what, what, what somebody has fed to us or said to us or what, what we have just accepted as truth. We have a responsibility as humans with intellect to get into the word of God and to see what the truth is. And Jesus Christ says this to a religious leader of his day. A man by the name of Nicodemus. You can read about it in John, the third chapter. A man who was good. A man who gave to the poor. A man who memorized scripture. A man who did all the right things. And Jesus, you would think to say, when the subject of heaven comes, you would think Jesus pats him on the back. But Jesus says, Nicodemus, you must be born again. Hollywood, our popular culture, our society makes such a mockery out of that. You think of radical, weirdo, crazy, out of control Christianity. Pastor Luke, I'm not buying what you're selling. First of all, I'm not selling any of it. But born again, I don't care what Hollywood's made it out to be. I don't care what our society has made it out to be. Because you know what? Trends come and they go. Hollywood comes and goes. Music comes and goes. Sitcom, sitcoms come and go. But the word of God is forever. And Jesus Christ says, you want to get into heaven, you've got to be born again. What is born again? It means that you've given God all of your life. You've given God all of your heart. It's an all or nothing relationship. You see, the devil in hell and demons in hell, the Bible tells us they know who God is. They're not going to heaven. It's not about your mental ascent towards God. I already know you know who Jesus is. That's why you're here in church tonight. It's not about your knowledge of him. It's about your heart and your life too. Let me prove it to you. The Bible says in the book of Revelation, Jesus Christ is speaking to the church. He says, I'm going to come back. And I better find you hot or I better find you cold. Because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. Whoa! Shocking statement. And what Jesus Christ is saying is that lukewarm Christians are not real Christians at all. And will be rejected and ejected from the kingdom of God. What does lukewarm mean? It's like anything in, a, in any relationship. It's a little bit up, a little bit down, a little bit in, a little bit out. Occasional church attendance, doing your own thing. Some, instead of God saying, kind of floating around. You know, if that was your marriage or if that was your friendship or your business relationship, occasional, uh, you know, token prayer or token conversation, shallow. You know that that relationship wouldn't go anywhere. Why would you expect it to be any different with God? God is saying, I want all of your heart, I want all of your life. Well, how do we get there? Jesus Christ said this. If you confess him before men, he'll confess you before his father. If you deny him before men, he'll deny you before his father. You see, the decision's yours. 
People oftentimes, I hear this, in, in, especially in our day and age, well, I have a hard time believing in a God that, that's in the business of condemning or sending people to hell. Let me tell you something. Hell was never created for you and I. It was never designed for you and I. God's not in the business of condemning or sending anybody to hell. That's why he gave Jesus Christ to die on the cross, a beaten, bloody mess, to be a spectacle so that you and I could give him our heart, you and I could give him our life and live a relationship with him so that we could have everlasting life, so we could have life more abundantly. The decision is totally ours, completely ours. God gave us the free will choice. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me, I'll deny you. So here today, I want to give you the opportunity. Here's what I'm going to do in just a moment. I'm going to count to three. I'm going to go one, two, and I'm going to count to three. I'm going to go bang! Smack my hands just together, just like that. Here's what I want to do. I want to give you the opportunity to ensure your place with God in heaven forever and ever and ever and ever. You say, Pastor, look, I don't know about heaven or hell. Let me tell you something. Just because you can't see it, because you can't feel it, because you don't experience it yet right now, doesn't mean it's not true. Listen, you know that there are radio waves and microwaves going through the air right over your head and right through everything that you and I live through to power your phone, your TV, all these different things. You know they exist, yet you can't see them. Come on. Let's get over that. Let's get beyond that. Heaven's a real place. Hell's a real place. It's time for us to get serious with the things of God. So I'm going to count to three. I'm going to go one, two, three, bang. And as I do, here's what I want you to do. I want you to be bold in this place. If you want to give Jesus Christ your heart, you want to give him your life, here's what I'm asking you to do. I'm asking you to pop your hand up. He said, if you confess me before men, I'll, I'll confess you before my Father. I'm a man. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it. You can put it right back down. We'll go forward from there. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is saying, Pastor Luke, I want to give him all my heart. I want to give him all my life. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it and put it right back down. You might say, Pastor Luke, I might be embarrassed. You know what? You might be, but this is the best decision of your life. Don't be embarrassed about that. This is a great decision. There's no reason to be embarrassed. Get over it. Stop listening to the wrong side of the story and start listening to God who says, come on, make this decision. Who should raise your hands? You've never given him your heart. You've never given him your life in a moment. If that's you, go ahead and pop your hand up. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it. Who should raise their hands if you've been living lukewarm, doing your own thing instead of God's thing, running from God instead of to God? Hey, come on, if that's you, get, in a moment, just get ready, pop your hand up, I'll see it, I'll acknowledge it. Who should raise their hand? You're not sure? Don't leave today without making sure. Come on, listen, I love you enough to tell you the truth. That's a gamble on your eternal life. You can't afford to make it. You don't know what's going to happen. I'm not trying to instill fear in your life, but I'm trying to get you to start thinking the right way. Today is your day of your salvation. All across this auditorium, from the front to the back, wherever you're at, whether you're watching online, in the full year, wherever you're at, this is your moment, this is your time. I'm going to count to three, and as I do, all at the same time, wherever, wherever you're at, I want you to pop your hand up. I'll see it, I'll acknowledge it, and put it right back down. We'll go forward in our relationship with Jesus Christ today. Today is your day. Here we go. Get ready. This is your moment. This is the time of your salvation. Here we go. Ready? One, two, three. Let me see your hands in this place. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I got you guys. Eight. I see that hand. Where's... I see Usher pointing over here. Give me a little bit of wave so I can see you. Nine, I got you. Ten, I got you. you are you pointing, Usher? Is that a, where are you? I don't know. Ten, anybody else in this area? Ten wise people. Eleven, I got you. Twelve, I saw that hand. Anybody else in this place? Say, man, I wonder if I should. Come on, you should. This is your moment. This is your time. Anybody else in this place? Twelve wise people. Anybody else in this place today? Anybody else in this place today? Well, praise God for 12 wise people. Hallelujah. I'm going to make this so easy on you because I said we're going to do something different. We're going to do something different. So I'm going to pray with you in your, in your seats, and then we're going to do our little thing, and then we'll follow it up, okay? So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to pray a prayer. The church is going to pray it with you. Say it out loud. The Bible says that if you confess with your mouth and believe with your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord and rose from the dead, you shall be saved. So today we're going to pray a prayer. It's not an abracadabra, a magical statement. It's believing with your heart, confessing it. So those of you who raise your hand, those of you who didn't raise your hand, if that's you in this place, you need to say this out loud and believe it. And as you do, you shall find salvation. So let's all do this. Let's all bow our head, close our eyes. I want everybody to repeat this prayer after me. Father God, I come to you today. And I acknowledge that I am in need of a Savior. Lord, I turn from my sin, and I look to you today. I believe that Jesus Christ came and lived on this earth, died on a cross, and rose again on the third day. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and I believe that he will live in my heart today. So, Lord... Come into my heart. 
Come into my life. Be the Lord and Savior of my life. I turn from my old ways today and I look to you. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Forgive me of my sins that I know I've made and that I have no clue about. And today, I will serve you all the days of my life. This is the first day of the rest of my life. I am a Christian. I am saved. I am headed for heaven in Jesus' name. We all say amen. Praise God. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son, and that you sent him for me, and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Bye-bye.